we have already behind the schedule. So we have about uh, six doctors available here to present. And uh, without uh, much delay, we'll uh, start the session. Uh, can I invite the first uh, speaker, presenter? Dr. Rajshekar Dhamma. Please limit your timings uh, because we are already scheduled late, sir, half an hour. Good morning. Uh, this is Dr. Rajshikar. I am presenting a uh, free paper on evaluation of MLOPA in children of 6 to 16 year age group at a tertiary care hospital. Uh, nil financial interest. Uh, introduction. MLOPA is a dullness of vision. It is defined as decrease of visual equity caused by pattern vision deprivation or abnormal binocular interaction for which no causes can be detected by physical examination of the eye and which in appropriate cases is reversible by therapeutic measures. In the development of visual system, critical period is between one week to three months of age, and patient will have deficit in accommodation, contrast sensi sensitivity, and spatial orientation. Patient usually have presentation first decade of life, and if not treated, it will go for lifetime. Prevalence in childhood is estimated to be one to four percent. Amblopia may be unilateral, and less often it is bilateral and visual loss in envelope varies from mild to severe degree. In a, uh, usually in 25% of the cases, visual equity is to be less than 6 by 30, and about in 75% of the cases, have vision 630 or better. Amblopic children are usually unaware of visual deficit, and objective of our study is to determine and evaluate the amblopia in children aged between 6 to 16 years. Material and methods of our study, it is, uh, it is a prospective observational study uh, conducted between 6 to 16 year age group with uh, com coming to our hospital with complaint of defective vision. A study duration was one year. Sample size or proposed sampling method was used. A um, minimum cases of 100 were taken. Uh, inclusion criteria, children aged between 6 to 16 years are included. Exclusion, those who are allergic to psychopentylate are homotropin are excluded and children less than 60, 6 years and more than 16 are excluded. Result of our study, mean age of presentation was 12 plus or minus 3 years. Uh, in our study, uh, in total 100 patients, uh, males were 59%, females and uh, females were 41%. And in our study, males were uh, more affected than females. Uh, Inulateral envelope was observed in 63% of the cases. Right eye was more affected, and all types of embolism are more commonly affected in males. And age group between 11 to 16 years in males, and 6 to 13 years females were more affected. Visual deficits were found between 618 to 660 range, and moderate embolopia is more uh, common than severe embolopia in our study. Age group between 6 to 10, 10 years, 33% of the children were affected, and, uh, and in 11 to 16 years, 67% of the children were affected. A bar chart uh, types, uh, type of envelope showing type of envelope. In our study, anisometropic and ametropic envelope are more commonly affected than other type of envelope. This is the age group uh, uh, between uh, gender. Uh, uh, between 6 to 10 years, females are more affected, and in between 11 to 16 years, uh, males were more affected. Comparison of type of envelope across the affected eye. In anisometropic eye, right eye and left eye are equally affected. In ametropic amet uh, uh, amblopia, uh, both eyes are equally affected. Uh, in our study, mean age of presentation was 12 plus or minus 3 years, uh, and 11 to 16 years, 67% of the children were affected, and in 59% uh, were boys and 41% were girls. In a uh, et al. study shows mean age was 9.2 plus or minus 2.8 years, girls were more affected. In our study, right eye is uh, most commonly affected, bilateral around 37% of the cases, and unilateral around 63% of the cases. Uh, uh, Merenzi and uh, SJ et al. shows left eye more commonly affected, 
and in lateral amblyopia was observed in 87.5% of the children. In our uh, study, uh, moderate degree amblyopia 75% of the cases and severe degree amblyopia 25% of the cases. Uh, Martha HRTL study shows mild to moderate amblyopia accounted in 83.12% uh, of the cases, severe amblyopia 16.87% of the cases. Uh, discussion, anisopentropic amblyopia in our study 44% of the cases and uh, ametropic amblyopia in 24% of the cases. Uh, conclusion, children will have late detection and it is a major, major preventable and treatable cause of low vision in children. Uh, being the major cause of monocular or bilateral low vision in adulthood. And this study shows the screening of children is very important in early detection and treatment of the amblyopic children. These are the references. Thank you. Was this in a school or a hospital-based setup? Ma'am, hospital-based, ma'am. And any reason you took six years as the beginning? Ma'am, uh, usually, ma'am, uh, below six years, they usually won't come, ma'am. In our uh, hospital, uh, uh, in our setup, uh, uh, we have seen, we use proposing sampling method, ma'am. Okay. Previous one year, two years, we data collected, ma'am. Okay. From that, uh, si below six year presentation was less. So uh, we've taken six to 16 years, ma'am. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. You, doctor? Yeah. Vedant, sir. Yeah. Okay. Very good morning to one and all. I'll be presenting a case of acquired accommodation and convergence insufficiency post a trauma traumatic brain injury. Uh, there, this study does not uh, receive any specific funding fee or support. Uh, introduction, traumatic brain injury refers to the, uh, to the resulting of physiological disruption of brain function after any external force impact on the head which may or may not be associated with structural damage to the brain. Accommodative insufficiency and convergence insufficiency are some of the most common visual problems following a traumatic brain injury. In the light of increased prevalence of traumatic brain injuries following road traffic ac accidents or combat sports, it is important for clinicians to be aware of the associated visual symptoms and methods of diagnosis and treatment. We describe a case of acquired accommodation and convergence insufficiency post a traumatic brain injury and its management. A 32-year-old male patient presented to us with a history of road traffic accident and traumatic brain injury. He presented to us one month post-trauma with complaints of blurred vision and difficulty in reading and focusing on nearby objects. There was no history of diplopia, headache, no ocular deviation prior to trauma, no history uh, of spectacle usage or ocular surgery prior. There was uh, no significant past or family history. The old MRI report post-trauma showed diffuse axonal injury of grade 3 in the midbrain and bilateral thalami. On uh, general examination, uh, the patient was uh, conscious, well-oriented. Systemic examination, uh, CNS examination, there was right hemiparesis, but the patient was uh, able to ambulate without support. Uh, Hirsch, on ocular examination, head posture was erect. Hirschberg test showed uh, left uh, exotropia of 15 degrees. The EOM was full and free in all gazes, in both eyes. On slit lamp examination, vision, refraction, anterior segment, uh, and fundus was normal. On uh, detailed orthoptic evaluation, uh, the stereopsis was 100 arc seconds. Uh, the Worth four dot test, there was left suppression with occasional fusion. Uh, there was, uh, uh, on cover test, there was uh, exotropia. The near point of convergence, there was a, a reduction and it was not converging. The near point of accommodation was reduced. The MEM retinoscopy, they showed a lag of accommodation. The PRA was reduced, and the uh, uh, positive fusional version was also reduced. Accommodative facility was also found to be reduced. We came to a diagnosis of convergence and accommodation insufficiency with acquired exotropia, secondary to traumatic brain injury. Uh, the treatment we initiated was a vision uh, treatment therapy. Uh, there was in-office vision therapy and also a home therapy. In, in office therapy, we trained the convergence. Considering the patient complained of double vision at 40 centimeters, we incorporated an exercising prism in trial frame and asked the patient to fuse the pen tip. As and when the patient was able to fuse at the earlier distance, the target distance was slowly reduced from 40 to 35 centimeters and the process was repeated again while reducing the exercise prism from five base out to two base out. Uh, for training of accommodation, the patient was trained to perform heart chart and accommodative flippers. 
with an N12 target. For home vision therapy, the patient was prescribed eccentric circle training uh, given to, uh, and the patient was able to converge for 10 seconds with a 10 base out exercising prism. Accommodative uh, flippers was also uh, prescribed. The patient was asked to wait for six months for improvement and plan for surgical correction if necessary. On follow-up after one month, uh, it was found that the patient had significant improvement in convergence and also mild improvement in accommodation. These are pictures showing the same. Our discussion. Oculomate or symptoms following traumatic brain injury may include blurred vision, convergence insufficiency, difficulty in reading. Uh, these, uh, it is very uh, necessary to uh, diagnose these patients because many of these patients, if treated with proper visual therapy, will improve without the need for any surgery. Hospital-based is, uh, it's said that you did, now how long did it forget? Uh, the patient was asked to come back uh, on weekly basis ma'am. Okay. So he came back and we were giving him in-office therapy. Weekly on basis once and then home therapy? On home and home therapy. How, how long it took to recover it? Uh, in one month, the recovery we saw was in one month we had for follow-up is asked to follow up every month. So exotropia first it was there and then in next uh, pictures exotropia was not there. It reduced. 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 Okay. Pupillary dilatation. There was no pupillary involvement. Uh, and even at follow up with NPH still only at 13. So that had you that given any flash glasses to this patient? No ma'am. He was uh, able to uh, read with without glasses. Plain no. So okay. we did not prescribe any glasses. And have you planned for surgery or? Uh, we want to see the improvement, ma'am. We want to wait for six months and then if there's complete improvement, then we want to improve. Prism glass you prescribed or you asked only for the only hospital? For the, only for training. Uh, the next presenter is uh, Vedant Razoria. She's there. Next K case, Santam Gopal. Dr. Isha Gupta. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity. I'll be presenting my outcomes of various surgical approaches to strabismus and congenital fibrosis of extraocular muscles. My co-authors are Dr. Deepti Joshi and Dr. Radhakrishnan Prasad sir. We have no financial disclosures and all consents were taken from patients to display data and their pictures. So why this study? This study was done because there are various forms of CFUM which are basically congenital cranial disinnervation disorders. And it is a primarily neurologic uh, disturbance from brain stem or cranial nerve development causing a secondary muscle fibrosis. So it becomes very challenging to treat. You cannot, you can never give a complete satisfactory 100% guaranteed result to a CFEM patient. That is where the experience of these surgeries and rare cases comes in so that you can provide a good quality of life. You always have to do a strabismus correction before ptosis surgery. And it, is, it always has unpredictable outcome. Our purpose was to evaluate outcomes of these strabismus surgeries in the cases that presented to our tertiary eye care hospital. So CFUM is like eye in a straight jacket. You have to push and pull from everywhere to correct the eye. Our study methods were a combined retrospective and prospective study between uh, cases presenting between 2021 and 2023. A complete ophthalmological examination was done. Neuroimaging was done only in cases of associated neurological systemic anomalies. So in total, we recruited nine cases of CFUM and recession procedures were mainly performed as per the need of case in one or two stages. Our inclusion criteria were ptosis and hypotropia since birth, a positive force tuction test. Uh, both unilateral and bilateral cases were allowed in the study. Exclusion criteria were if the cases were FDT negative as if no restriction any previous ptosis surgery, any acquired ptosis or Marcus Gunja wing ptosis, or any other ocular surface disease or orbital anomaly, which, rest which is restricting the eye. 
This was a surgical technique, carefully hooking the muscles. As you can see, the muscle is so much fibrous and posteriorly insert, inserted in these cases. Careful suturing and cutting. Then FDT was done along every step to ensure that the eye is free. And then a hangback recession was done to uh, avoid complications like scleral perforation for large recessions. Some of our, one of our patients. So total nine cases, six males and three females were operated in the study. Seven cases were hereditary and two were sporadic. Mean age was 12.3 years because in our clinic we have an age limit of 14 to 15 years. Then all cases, we received all bilateral cases, we did not receive any unilateral cases. Eight exotropias were there with hypertropia, ptosis and chin up AHP. One, only one case of esotropia with hypertropia, ptosis and chin up AHP. Seven cases underwent single stage surgery and two cases required two stage procedures. Only one sporadic case had associated neurological anomaly for which MRI was done. So this is the outline of our nine cases that we did. As you can see, mostly it is large angle exotropia with large angle hypotropia. So I'll just highlight a few important outcomes. So only one in one case, we did not tackle the exotropia, but only the hypotropia. And we had to give crutch classes to clear the visual axis in this case. Then in one case of esotropia, we had to do a periosteal fixation of lateral rectus to bring the eye into the uh, alignment. As you can see, the ptosis cleared in most of the cases, but three cases had to be given crutch classes for clearing the visual axis, and only one case underwent frontalis link surgery to correct the ptosis. The maximum correction was we, uh, achieved was in case of periosteal fixation of the lateral rectus in the esotropia case. Also, a good correction could be achieved in case of where we did large hangback recessions in the last two cases. So these were our surgical plans. This is one of the, this is a clinical profile of one of our uh, best corrected cases. As you can see, preoperatively there is a large chin up head posture, uh, large hypotropia and exotropia. On table, we, des we desired to achieve a overcorrection so that at 45 days postoperatively, this was the status of the child and he was maintaining a clear visual axis with minimal chin up head posture at day 45. Our primary outcomes showed that mean post-operative angle of hypertropia was 13.7 PD with high statistically significant difference before and after the surgery. Mean residual exotropia was 18.1 uh, prism diopters. Secondary outcomes for ptosis showed that mean post-operative mean uh, reflex uh, MRD1 was 1.3 uh, with standard deviation of 0.8 mm. And ptosis improved in 5 out of 9 patients, that is 55 persons with the uh, strabismus surgery alone. Three patients required crutch classes while only one patient had undergone a frontalis link surgery. Stents of a study, are we had a larger sample size as compared to other uh, uh, surgeries. There was no genetic testing done for our surgery. We compared our study with the two famously uh, published studies, one with the So I would like to conclude that uh, large hangback recessions are very important in case of congenital fibrosis of extraocular muscles. And you always have to do a stage procedure. You have to cross hurdle by hurdle to reach the uh, conclusion of this. Uh, Thank you. Were they hangback or hemi-hangback? Sir, ma'am, all were hangbacks. Uh, and uh, how long have you seen the post-operatively? So uh, the first case that we recruited was in 2021. So uh, the last follow-up for that case was six months back. That was one and a half years. And the last case that we saw was two months of the latest follow-up. And are you seeing that the correction is coming down with time? Because yes, definitely, ma'am. Because on table, we were satisfied with the results. But eventually, the eye comes into a resting position, which is somewhere in between the original and our on table uh, corrections. So definitely, I would suggest that on table achieve as much of over correction as possible, because the eye eventually will go back because of all the fibrosis and push and pull around the eyeball. Inferior rectus in general tends to creep up. So yes, hemi hangback is better to have at least some sphere so you would prevent it going all the way. The other question I had is, I'm assuming there was no bells in these patients. No, no, ma'am. So the patient with frontalis sling, was there any exposure? We did under correction of the frontalis sling. We just cleared the visual axis okay. because the child had a large chin up head posture. Okay. So we just cleared the visual axis and we are maintaining the patient on nightly uh, ointments, nightly okay. gels. Did you do any uh, 
any adjustable suture in uh, no ma'am no ma'am the first uh, reference study that i showed they had done adjustable suture but our age group is 9 to 14 years okay. and to uh, counsel the patients that the child might we might have to put the child again under general anesthesia or the it will be painful yes, for the yes. child to adjust so our age group we couldn't cannot do uh, adjustable surgery okay. thank you thank you so much Next Timer can be restarted. I think timer was already running. Good morning, respected judges and this August gathering. I am Dr. Pragya Padacharji, and I will be presenting my paper on Helvesin syndrome, patient tailored management. No financial disclosures. As we all know, Helvesin syndrome or the triad exotropia is a rare and intriguing set of strabismic conditions manifesting with dissociated vertical deviation, superior oblique av overaction, and A pattern exotropia. So in this paper, I will be reporting two such rare cases of Helvesin syndrome it attending our OPD with variable decrease of primary gaze horizontal deviation with good surgical post-operative surgical outcomes. Now, there can be variable permutations of surgical procedures, but choosing one can be extremely challenging. Pertaining to the variable extents of the presentation, the unpredictable outcomes of the surgery, and the multiple surgical procedures that we have to do. But as we know that one key does not fit all locks. Similarly, management of Helvestin entails to be individually oriented. It is a prospective study of two patients, both were thoroughly evaluated, and based on the magnitudes of deviation, the procedure of choice was chosen. Post-surgery, both of the cases were followed up at regular intervals. The first case is a 20-year-old female who presented with the chief complaint of outward deviation, both eyes alternatingly since birth. No other positive history except for a positive family history of exotropia in her sister. General examination, slit lamb evaluation, and best corrected visual acuity were normal. Coming to squint evaluation proper, she presents with a compensatory head posture of face turned to the left with chin down. The HCRT showed a large angle primary gaze deviation along with a vertical deviation of seven degrees. When we performed the cover-uncover test, we saw that there was, on covering the right eye, the left eye comes inwards and downwards with fast redressal of movement. Under cover, the right eye goes upwards and outwards, and on uncovering, it remained the same. Similar findings were seen on the other eye, and on performing the alternate cover test, we saw, we saw that both the eyes moved inwards and downwards, alternatingly to take our fixation with fast movement of redress and also associated with fine latent nystigmas. In this slide, we can appreciate the dissociated vertical deviation. The non-fixating eye is upwardly drifted, and it is associated with extortion and abduction of the deviated eye. When we did the prism cover, we found again a large angle of 80 to 90 prism diopter space in with a vertical deviation of 18 prism diopter space down. Post occlusion, we saw a very significant difference of 20 prism diopter space in from up gaze to down gaze, thereby telling that it is in fact an A pattern of exotropia. Extraocular movements validated the similar findings of A pattern exotropia along with both eyes superior oblique overaction. To manage this case, both eyes underwent lateral rectus recession along with infraplacement of half of the muscle, followed by the fade in operation of the superior rectus. Postoperatively, very good outcome was seen with the correction of the DVD, with collapse of the A pattern, and with reduction of magnitude of superior overaction and horizontal gaze deviation. Now coming to my second case, which is again a similar case of a 24-year-old man presenting with outward deviation of both eyes since birth, no other positive history, general examination, slit lamb evaluation, visual equity were good. On squint evaluation, he now presents with a, with a compensatory head position of head tilt towards the left hand side. HCRT showed a large angle primary gaze deviation with a vertical deviation of right eye more than the left eye. Again, cover and cover test, alternate cover test is similar as the case before. Here we can appreciate the DVD component. On doing the, P the prism cover test, we saw that there was a large angle of 70 to 90 prism diopter space in with a vertical deviation of 20 to the right eye and left eye 18 prism diopter space down. 
When we did the post occlusion, we saw a very significant difference of 40 prism diopters base in from up gaze to down gaze, thereby telling that it is a very significant A pattern exotropia. And we can also appreciate the superior oblique overaction in the picture here. To manage this case, left eye lateral rectus uh, recession resection surgery was done along with both eye superior oblique pos posterior tenectomy. Here is a small video, but because of paucity, I will be moving ahead. Postoperatively, we saw a correction of DVD, a very good collapse of the A pattern deviation, and also reduction in the magnitude of superior oblique overaction and horizontal gaze. Now, there is no singular dictum for management of Helvestin, but based on the magnitudes of deviation, we can make our own algorithm. So like in case one and two, we can see that there has been very good correction of all the components of Helvesin syndrome, and noteworthy is the near orthotropia that could be achieved for case two. Therefore, to conclude, in both the cases of Helvesin syndrome following the surgical procedures, very good and optimum outcome has been shown, which was acceptable to the patients and tailored to their management of deviation. With this, I conclude. Thank you very much. Recession for uh, DVDs after uh, this? Yes, ma'am. For the first case, superior rectus recession was done, uh -huh. but not for the second case, ma'am. Okay, okay. And uh, how far, uh, means uh, what did you do for superior oblique? What is the surgical Ma'am, in the first case, we did not really touch for the superior oblique. Okay. But in the second case, where the superior oblique overaction was very significant, we did superior oblique posterior tenectomy, ma'am. A pattern after surgical, no? You say it got collapsed. Uh, ma'am, in the first case, there was residual, but in the second case, we had a very good correction, ma'am. Okay. Why the A head, why was there an abnormal head posture? Ma'am, they actually, because of the different components of Helvestin, they had anomalous head posture. In the second case, it is, I can justify it to you because she had a very good superior oblique overaction. The he had a very good superior oblique overaction, so the compensatory was to the opposite side. But the first case, she actually had a left deviation more than the right deviation, but still she comes with a left head turn. And how was the torsion in the first patient, in both patients? Ma'am, in the first. Of the torsion. Ma'am, ma the in first patient was plus two, the second patient was plus three. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. So the next presenter is uh, Dr. Mautika Kondapani. Good morning, everyone. My name is Dr. Kondapalli Mautika. I'm today presenting topic of exotropic deviations stacking away numerous neuroophthalmological conditions. Introduction. Concomitant exotropias are common presentations in strabismus and neuroophthalmology OPD. As we all know, exotropias are outward deviation of the eye and they are most common strabismic complaints. But most common presentations with, with neuro, neuroophthalmology OPD pa patients present are uh, restriction of extraocular movements and double vision. Some extrotropias are actually the indicators of underlying neuroophthalmological conditions. Relevant history, examination, documentation of comorbidities, and neuroimaging are important tools to grab the diagnosis. My purpose of the study is to present three cases of exotropias in neuroophthalmological background. Materials and methods. My study design is prospective observational study done in Department of Strabismus and Neuroophthalmology OPD, Sarojini Deve Hospital, Hyderabad, for a duration of three months. Coming to the study proper, out of all the patients presenting with chief complaints of outward deviation of the eyes, three cases were presented, comprehensive orthoptic ophthalmology evaluation along with refraction, anterior segment examination and fundus examination were done, neuroimaging wherever necessary was advised. Coming to the first case, a 48-year-old male patient came with the complaints of drooping of upper eyelid, prominence of left eye, dull pain of the left eye, headache, double vision in the left eye since two weeks, history of weight loss since one month is seen. He is a known alcoholic since 15 years, no history of other comorbidities. On examination, compensatory head posture is present in the form of face turn towards right. Facial symmetry is lost due to left brow elevation. Ocular symmetry is lost due to proptosis and ptosis. Vision in both eyes is 636 with pinhole improving to 624. Hertels showed axial proptosis in the left eye. HCRT showed 10 degrees exotropia in the left eye. Extraocular movements are grossly limited in all the directions in the left eye. Anterior segment examination, no abnormality is detected. 
uh, this is a nine gaze picture of the patient, which is showing the restricted movements in all gazes in the left eye. MRI of brain and orbits with contrast is showing T2 heterogeneous ISO2 hypo-intense lesion with uh, intense heterogeneous post-contrast enhancement, the feature suggestive of orbital inflammatory pseudotumor. Management diagnosis of left eye orbital inflammatory pseudotumor was confirmed and patient was started on tablet Visalon 60 mg once daily and drastic improvement within one week is seen. Second case, 52-year-old male patient came with the complaints of sudden loss of vision of right eye, drooping of upper eyelid, headache, double vision since 10 days. History of lead, painful vesicular lesions over the right side of the forehead and scalp is seen 20 days ago for which he received no treatment. Uh, vision in the right eye is 160 not improving further. HCRT is showing 20 degrees exotropia and extraocular movements are limited in all the directions except abduction in the right eye. Worth folder test is showing diplopia. Anterior segment examination is showing right eye of RAPD. Right eye RAPD. Uh, these are the uh, vesicular lesions present on the forehead of the patients and this is a 9 gaze picture showing the exotropia in the primary gaze and uh, limitation of movements in uh, right eye. Diagnosis of right eye herpes zoster ophthalmoplegia was made and the patient was started on tablet acyclovir 400 mg 5 times a day and the patient was lost to follow up. Third case, a 48 year old male patient came with the complaints of double vision, outward deviation of the left eye, pain and headache since 20 days, which is acute in onset, history of transient ischemic attack one month before the symptoms was there, known case of hypertensive on medication. Uh, this is a nine gaze picture of the patient uh, presenting with exotropia in the primary gaze and uh, ad adduction deficiency in the left eye. Uh, compensatory head posture in the form of right face turn is seen. Facial symmetry is fairly maintained. Ocular symmetry is lost due to left eye exodeviation. Uh, in HCRT, 20 degrees exotropia is seen in the left eye. Extraocular movements showed ad adduction deficiency along with ataxic nystagmus on attempted dextroversion in the right eye. Investigations were done. MRA of brain with contrast showed tiny hyperintensities in the left corona radiata and pons with restriction on diffusion suggestive of acute infarcts. Diagnosis of left internuclear ophthalmoplegia was made. Appropriate counseling of the patient and neurophysician referral was made. In conclusion, the presence of an exotropia, particularly if it is incompetent, may represent a manifestation of neurological disease. Careful quantitation, observation of any associated neurological signs and symptoms, and consideration of the factors which contribute to adduction, convergence, or conjugate gaze may aid in differential diagnosis of these conditions. This study emphasizes the importance of complete and thorough examination of all the exotropia cases to look for other associations and take help of neuroimaging wherever required. Thank you, and special thanks to my guide and co-author, uh, Dr. Raman, sir. For the second patient, what was the optic nerve finding? Uh, vision Op was 1 by 60. Vision was 1 by 60. There was no uh, disc edema as such. Or, or disc pallor, nothing? No, 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 disc pallor was nothing, ma'am. The involvement is purely retroorbital. Patient appreciated diplopia with one meter vision. Which patient, ma'am? Second patient. That you told RAPD is this. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. He could. Yes, ma'am. But uh, it's actually acute in onset, so he complained initially. Thank you. Our next presenter is uh, Dr. Devika Saxena. Good, mo good morning, everyone. Obscure intracranial pathology manifesting as acute acquired comatant esotropia. My experience at NARIO in Telangana, I am Dr. Devika Saxena, and my guide is Dr. Vaira. Introduction, acute acquired comatant esotropia is a type of strabismus characterized by sudden onset of esotropia with diplopia, often occurring in children, teenagers, and young adolescents, occurs after complete development of binocular function usually, with successful recovery of stereopsis after treatment. It can be easily confused with six-nerve palsy because of its sudden onset, and hence motor evaluation for complete full and free movement of duction and version is necessary. It's been classified into four types, the swan, the burin frangetti, the Bielshawski, those caused by intracranial pathology and idiopathic, and hence, on presentation, a contrast-enhanced MRI is 
required to rule out any other neurological cause or when no etiology has been identified. The purpose of my study is to report a series of cases of AACE presenting due to varied intracranial pathologies and highlighting the importance of imaging contrast enhanced MRI as a tool to help identify intracranial pathologies presenting as AACE, especially when no other etiology can be identified. A prospective study where 23 patients of acute acquired comitant esotropia were taken, 14 male, 9 female, mean age being 16.6, were evaluated between May 2022 and April 2023. Uh, Burin Franchetti type scene was 1, BL Shlosky type 1, intracranial pathology were 5, and idiopathic were 12. Of the 5, those were with the intracranial pathologies, 2 had tuberculum meningitis, five, uh, 1 was a 5 year old child with supracellular craniopharyngioma, and 2 were females with idiopathic intracranial hypertension. Case 1 is of a 22 year old female with sudden onset of decrease in vision with severe headache, diagnosed as right eye acute acquired comatant esotropia, advised contrast enhanced imaging on which tuberculum of the brain was diagnosed. CSF analysis also showed tuberculum meningitis. ATT was started for the patient as seen as esotropia was seen. In the picture, HCRT was 10 degrees of esotropia and PBCT was 20, di prison diopters base out. Extraocular mo movements were full and free and tuberculum meningitis was seen on CSF analysis. Contrast enhanced MRI showed uh, uh, tuberculum, uh, tubercular abscess was seen. The second case is again of an 18 year old female with decrease of vision and inward deviation since 2016 with history of tubercular meningitis and complete treatment taken. 15 degrees of esotropia was seen in the picture as seen and PVCT was 35 present diopters base out. E extraocular movements were full and free. Squint correction was done for the same and HCRT was central in both the eyes. Third case is of the five year old child who presented with inward deviation of eye since 20 days. There wasn't a history of fever 20, uh, 20 days back. Other all history was insignificant. 15 degrees of esotropia was seen. Fundus showed bilateral uh, disc margin blurring and disc edema showing papal edema was there. And hence, it's, and its CRT was also 15 degrees esotropia. On sending for contrast enhanced MRI, MRI, we could see a 4.2 into 2.63 and to 3.5 midline extra axial multiloculated, predominantly cystic and non enhancing supracellar mass lesion, which suggested of a supracellar craniopharyngioma radiologically. The patient, as seen in the images, we can see. The patient was uh, sent further to the neuro, uh, neurosurgeon for further management, has been lost to follow up. Case four and five are of young females with uh, idiopathic intracranial hypertension. This is a 33-year-old male, di uh, female diagnosed with hypertension and diabetes mellitus 15 days back and started on medication. Uh, Esotropia of 15 degrees was seen. Uh, extraocular movements were full. Uh, partial empty cella with no spurs occupying lesion was seen on MRI with pain contrast. She was presumed idiopathic intracranial hypertension, secondary to hyperplastic, less transverse, and sigmoid sinus, presenting as acute acquired comitant esotropia. Acetosolamide was started for it, and following which there was resolution of her ocular complaints. The fifth case is, uh, as mentioned, a 17 year old female with headache and double vision since two weeks. No other positive history was there. Uh, bilateral disc edema was seen, HCRT was 15 degrees esotropia, and extraocular muscles were uh, full and free. It was again diagnosed on contrast enhanced MRIs, idiopathic intracranial hypertension. Discussion, it clearly shows in these five cases that MRI has to be used with contrast to establish the cause if no other etiology has been found. And then we can uh, do a multidisciplinary approach for the management. Results as seen. Uh, there were five cases of the 23 cases that I have collected. 21.73 is the percent. Sex distribution of male is to female is 1 is to 4. Youngest at presentation is 5. Oldest is presentation is 33. Brain tuberculosis, two patients, idiopathic intracranial hypertension were again two patients of the five, and cranial pharyngioma case was 1. I conclude by reiterating the need for in, uh, contrast enhanced MRI or any neurological imaging to find out the etiology in cases of acute acquired comitant esotropia. And also the study does show that most cases, though of AAC had other causes like arnulture and mal malformation and astrocytoma, our centers had different intracranial pathologies. Thank you. like a lot of slides, but you were on time. So the, uh, did you compare uh, with other studies? Do you review of literature? Because 21% having positive neurological findings in AAC is quite high. I mean, it's a good number that other studies usually show less than 10%. Yes, ma'am. There hasn't been. There has been one recently in May 2023 where they have done a review of literature for most cases, but they haven't had this higher number. And this was in one year that uh, started in April 2022, and we coming to uh, May 2023, uh, we could collect. But since I'm still collecting a lot of more cases and waiting for six months more before I could finally conclude into my studies, when I will go and review back and compare it with other studies.
of the other 80 percent where the neurological findings were nil? There weren't any neurological findings, ma'am. So where the question about mobile usage, because that is what we are seeing. The yes, ma'am. That, that uh, near vision and excessive accommodation that is happening, that I have incorporated into my studies for the other cases as well. How long do you study Ma'am, this is just uh, uh, 13 months. 13. My, I started in April 2000. In all cases are extraocular movements are prevented. Yes, ma'am. There is no palsy. Yes. There is no palsy. And diplopia is there in five cases. Yes, ma'am. Diplopia is there. The child did not complain, but the mother had noticed when that five-year-old child, uh, he left. Did you do any surgical procedure for this after six months and you waited? Uh, Ma'am, in one of the studies, the first one with tubercular meningitis, we are following her up. We haven't done because ATT has been started for her. The second case, which is there, uh, the girl, which had a previous episode of tubercular, uh, tuberculosis, for her surgical correction was done and there's complete resolution, ma'am. The rest, the five-year-old child was lost to follow-up and the other two of the idiopathic intracranial hypertension, both of them were started in acetobazolamide and they have been followed up with resolution of symptoms that has been seen. Thank you. Thank you. Our next presenter is uh, Dr. Rahul Poginin. Good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Rahul Goginani. My topic is uh, true muscle transplantation surgery in a case series of concomitant large angle alternate exotropia under the guidance of Dr. Raman, sir. So uh, large angle alternate exotropia, it presents with uh, more than 70 to 75 prism diopters of deviation in both eyes alternatively. And uh, it poses a lot of challenges in management due to high rates of recurrence and surgeries of multiple muscles that is required to gain the alignment. So until 60 prism diopters, uh, Surgeries are associated with least complications, but more than that, uh, we need uh, uh, two or more muscle surgeries in two eyes. So in the event of recurrences, less number of muscles are spared, and larger or maximal recession resections are associated with lid lengthening and palpable fissure height complications. So uh, therefore, we uh, obviate to obviate the need for the second surgery, we go for muscle transplantation. The muscle transplanted part acts like a biological spacer and the ocular motility is also not compromised. So to report the results in a case series of 19 patients of large angle concomitant alternate exotropia surgically corrected by the surgery. All age group patients presenting with 75 to 90 prism diopters were included in this study. Comprehensive ophthalmic and orthoptic evaluation were undergone and uh, preoperative evaluation, postoperative evaluation on day one, seven, one month, six months and for some patients, one year were also undertaken. Orthotropia is said to be achieved if uh, less than 10 prism diopters of exo or eso deviation is there. In this procedure, the lateral rectus muscle is initially hooked and isolated. Later, the intermuscular septum is cut and followed by medial rectus muscle is cut. Then we, the resected part of the medial rectus is now transplanted to the lateral rectus and the proximal end is anchored to the sclera at the desired site of fixation. This resected part acts as a biological spacer. So uh, coming to a few cases, uh, uh, the first case is an 80-year-old child. Uh, no significant past history was present. She presented with a CHP of right head tilt and uh, facial symmetry, ocular symmetry were maintained. HCRT was 30 degree exotropia in right eye. Alternate cover test showed both eye moving into take fixation. So with PBCT, we can see in post-occlusion around 70 to, 70 to 75 prism diopters were present and muscle transplantation was performed in this, uh, in this patient. That is 10.5 mm lateral rectus recession and 6.5 mm medial rectus resection in the left eye uh, were performed. You can see the uh, pre-operative photo and now uh, post-operative photographs of this child. Now coming to the next child, 14-year-old uh, uh, female, uh, paternal history, paternal aunt presented with uh, strabismus and 40-degree uh, exotropia was present in the HCRT full and free movements were present and post occlusion showed uh, 80 prism diopters deviation similarly muscle transplantation surgery was performed in this child and we can see the results in this uh, patient so uh, similarly another 15 year old boy uh, family history present and uh, both a uh, uh, anterior segment and fundus were within normal limits he presented with chp again left head tilt and uh, facial symmetry ocular symmetry were maintained and uh, post-occlusion PBCT was 75 prism diopters. 
similarly, muscle transplantation surgery was undergone, and he was also uh, orthotropic at the end of six months as well. Uh, this, this was a peculiar case, 31-year-old. Uh, he presented with uh, uh, paradoxical diplopia. Muscle transplantation surgery was undergone. And uh, as you can see in this diplopia charting and worth 4 dot, you can see uncrossed diplopia. Uh, we followed him up for one, and one year, and recently also he has come to our department, and orthotropia is still present. So uh, this, oh, this is the only case which uh, presented with undercorrection, 33-year-old male. So uh, he presented with 90, uh, he had 90 prism diopters deviation uh, in post-occlusion PBCT. Muzzle transplantation was undergone. Uh, around 15 degrees exotropia was present at the end of six months. So uh, out of the results of 19 cases, 47% uh, were males and 52% uh, were females. Orthotropia was achieved in uh, 18 cases, that is 94% of the cases, and uh, undercorrection was seen in only one patient. Pediatric population was 47% of the cases. So uh, uh, pre mean preoperative deviation in all the cases was around 75 prism diopters, and mean postoperative deviation was 5 prism diopters out of all the 19 cases. So with the help of this surgery, effective length of muscle could be increased, and therefore results could be improved. They could. Uh, Though there could be abduction limitation due to excessive weakening, no such motility restriction is uh, no, noticed in these cases. And uh, although large recessions and resections can cause severe restriction, therefore incompetence after getting a good prom uh, primary position. Thank you. Yeah. Did you do any comparative study for these things? Means transplantation versus... Uh uh, actually, madam, Simple, uh, uh, resection, resection. Uh, I haven't done com compared to study, ma'am. This is my thesis topic, uh, uh, checking for uh, novel surgery, uh, true muscle transplantation. So to observe the results in these patients, we could. Transplantation, what did you do in transplantation? Uh, ma'am, uh, we uh, resect the medial rectus part, ma'am. Can I show you the picture? Yes. Here, ma'am. Uh, so we, uh, the yellow part, the top, top right corner, yellow part, the muscle is uh, resected and it is uh, anchored next to the lateral rectus muscle, ma'am. Yeah. Medial rectus muscle is resected and that part acts as a biological spacer, ma'am. It is anchored next to the lateral rectus muscle through muscle transplantation surgery. How many of these patients were amblyopic eyes? Uh, none of them were amblyopic, ma'am. All of them had uh, six by uh, nearly six by six vision or six by nine. Both of them were alternate exotropia. And again, comparison with literature because most of literature is on esotropia. Yes, ma'am. Exo exactly, ma'am. Exactly, ma'am. So that's why we took up this study, ma'am, to study large angle alternate exotropia because we have good results in uh, we have many results in uh, esotropia. Any uh, in none of the cases you had limitation of abduction post op. No, madam. Okay. Uh, oh, one pay, oh, only the uh, negative result we got was one patient present with slight undercorrection due to large angle deviation. He had 90 prism diopters initially. Okay. Rest of the patients were around 75 prism diopters. Abduction di limitation was No, ma'am. No, ma'am. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Uh, we have a lost presenter, Dr.